So it wasn't but a few months later that um, the doctor and the nurse that was so greedy married in the home that he lived with in his marriage with his wife, which I thought was just really nasty, but, you know, anyway, uh, just fishy things going on there. Hello and welcome back to my channel. If you're new to my channel, I hope you enjoy it. I do all kinds of topics. And today I'm going to do something different. I'm going to have a little lanyard. And that means a little something extra. I'm going to do some true crime. I ran across some articles from this town that I'm in right now which was the town I was born and raised in, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Um, I went down to the coast about the time it happened, and I stayed in the Mississippi Gulf Coast, and I raised my children, and I worked. And my life was mostly spent there. I come back up here, and I run across the story of that. I couldn't believe it. All I could hear in my head was like my dad going, oh, she moved to the simple coast. She's on the simple coast. <laughs> and all the stuff was happening up here. But I love this city. Um, it's a college town, University of Southern Mississippi. But I was appalled to hear of this. But this story is not about racism. It's about greed. And honey, it tore this Mississippi family up. It is so sad. So I'm going to get right into it. So let's go. Okay. First up, I'm going to give you the storyline. And then I'm going to show you the pictures. And then I'll go into more of the story. Okay, the story is about a cardiologist who was a founder of the Hattiesburg Clinic, which is humongous now. Um, they have different floors with different specialists like dialysis, uh, imaging, heart doctors, you know, really the specialists. And it's right across from the Forest General Hospital. So they're all tied in together under the Hattiesburg Clinic. So anyway, uh, he was rich and he was a heart surgeon. So you know he had money. And he was married, had been married for quite some time. We'll get into all that. And he had a home out, I think it was in Lake Serene because it was by the lake that way from me, not too far. And we're, we're, we're going to look at that. And um, there was this woman who had been married, and she was working under uh, the doctor, and she wanted him for her own. Of course, she wanted the money, too, mainly the money. So he and her... Be became close, and not too long after they became close, they became really close, like lover close. And then one day, he called, I'm sorry, she called his home. And that set off the chain of events that broke everything down and destroyed his family. They had, uh, his wife had one daughter and, um, I think that's all they had. As we get into it, we'll look, but, um, I think that's all they had was one daughter 
And um, I'm sure that's all they had, yeah. But when the wife found out, she was threatening to commit suicide. She had a gun, she ran outside, and she tripped, and the gun went off and shot her, shot herself in the head. And she was in the hospital for a little while, but <clears throat> she was brain dead, so damn, she died. Um, so it wasn't but a few months later that um, the doctor and the nurse that was so greedy, married in the home that he lived with in his marriage with his wife, which I thought was just really nasty. But, you know, anyway, just fishy things going on there. So she got... She wanted that social life of a doctor wife. She got that. She got the money. He was making, you know, as a, as a heart surgeon, he was making humongous money. I mean, I couldn't even tell you how much, but they were very rich, very rich. Okay. So his health started to decline. He needed a a liver transplant, and he was on the the list to get that. But, you know, he was having to wait in line like everybody else. And he was still working, but he was really going down because he had diabetes as well. And he was having to stop working. Um... Because he had gotten a, he he had gotten so sick, he was like in his final stages of liver disease, and he was having to wear insulin pump. He was attached. He was just really sick. So he wasn't. He didn't have the surgeon salary anymore, and she was trying to poison him or something before, but. He was not dying quick enough for her. So her being a nurse, she knew what kind of medications to get to put someone under and to kill them. So she had the perfect way to do it. But she was not, she was too obvious in it. So... She took the, the insulin pump and she injected these medications into it because they checked to see if he had any injection marks on him, and he didn't. But she had injected into the insulin pump these medications. I, I'll tell you what they were later. But when they came to get him, she says, oh, I need that insulin pump. Because she had to clear the memory of what was put in it. So um, she took the insulin pump and everything. And that made people look at her kind of suspiciously. And um, they did take him in and they took his blood. And they found these medications in his blood. So, of course, they charged her and took her to trial. And, oh, Lord, when they, the jury came back and she was about to be sentenced, this woman was scared. She was, like, shaking it. I mean, she really had a bad reaction. But it's wild. It's wild. But uh, I'm going to go back and get the pictures for you now and put them on here. Do a little more commentary, but I'm going to do it over the pictures.
that's a bad the story. She wanted a doctor. She got the doctor. She called his house. The wife and him had the argument. The wife ran out with the gun, threatened to kill herself. She tripped. She fell. Gun went off. Hit her in the head. She died. And um, a few months later, which the daughter said was too soon, they married um, in their family home. Then the woman uh, tried to uh, kill him, but she she said he wasn't growing fast enough. So she put the drugs in the insulin pump. She grabbed the insulin pump back real quick before they could get it and check it. But they found the medications that were not supposed to be in his blood. And we're going to look at the rest through pictures. So here we go. This is a photograph of Dr. David Stevens with his wife, Karen, the lady he married. And they had two children. They did have two. They had Kristen and a boy named Alan. You didn't see Alan too much in the spotlight for unknown reasons. Kristen was very active, though in the trial and also any areas where there was public speakings or anything involving the trial, she was there. Now, this little lady here, Karen, with her husband, David, she probably was side by side with him when he was going to school. She probably helped him to attain his goals. And she should be the one that reaps the fruit because she was with him every step of the way. And sadly, we hear these kind of things happening. The man goes after a younger woman after the first wife had stood by him all these many years. That really hurts a woman. really does. I mean, David, I, I, I'm not going to say what I'm thinking, but you probably know. But anyway... She had the gun in her mouth. I do not know what was said on the phone call when that vixen nurse called the home of that family. I don't know if she said she was sleeping with her husband or what, but Karen here ran out the door with a gun in her mouth, threatening suicide. She fell. The gun went off. It was in her mouth. So, yes, the the gunshot proved to be fatal after a few days. It's a very, very sad. Dr. David Stevens was a respected heart surgeon. And he worked out of the Hattiesburg Clinic, which was behind the Forest General Hospital, where he did his surgeries. He was very well respected in the medical profession that he was in. Now, some of this is getting real close to home here. My mother was a heart patient, and she always went to Hattiesburg from Simpson County. And she had, she went to the Hattiesburg Clinic, and then if she had to be hospitalized, she was in Forest General. So it was all about that same time. She was in this hospital right here. And this is just half a mile from where I live. But there's a good possibility that she would have seen Dr. David Stevens, which is it's getting a little close to home for me. Very close. Very close. Okay. Let's enter... The vixen, the one that called the house, the home of the surgeon, his family home, where his wife lived, his children came, probably grew up in that house, beautiful home. Now, we're not letting the doctor off the hook because he knew better. She was the nurse that worked under him. She was the nurse that wooed him, but he's still not off the hook. 
he knew better, okay? She was 25 years his junior. 25 years. She wanted what Karen had. She wanted, first of all, she wanted the money. Then she wanted the prestige of being a doctor's wife, a surgeon's wife. So I didn't go... They didn't go too well in Hattiesburg because Hattiesburg is a town where everybody knows what everybody's doing and they don't accept that kind of behavior. If you're going to be in social circles that really are prestigious and, you know, loyal and trusted and, you know, just has dignity, she didn't have any of that. She went after that man. She didn't care about his wife. She didn't care about his children. She cared about his money, the prestige she would have, which she didn't have. And, you know, she could say, I'm a doctor's wife. She had those things in her mind when she went after him. I can just see them working together in the operating room and her, like, you know, doing what, a woman would do, you know, you know, snuggling up, choking, teasing, and then it led to, and she probably planned it, calling his home and his dear wife answering the phone. I can only imagine what she might have said to his wife to cause his wife to react that way. You think his wife put in all the work, and it's not for her to get the rewards from it his wife is the one that did all the work his wife is the one that raised his children his wife is the one that made sure he had clothes where that were clean that he had a home to come home to his wife put in a lot of effort she did double effort with him they were both working together for what for this woman to come in and reap the benefits and for him, okay, it was 1996, I believe, was when the woman died, Karen. And then he married her in 1997. It wasn't even a year later because she died like in March. It, it's just unheard of. His respect, if he had any, just went boo, down the drain. Flush the commode. I mean, I'm telling you. That's just not the way anybody who has prestige operates in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Not back then. I mean, it's, it's, that was like 40 years ago or so. So it's really tight knit for the elite. I'm sorry to say, but that was just the way it was. I could get all heated just talking about it right now. I wanted to recognize Kristen. This is a sweet photo of Kristen with her father. I don't have anything with Alan. Kristen was standing up every step of the way. She deserves to be recognized. I'm sorry about the quality of this picture, but before digital came along, when you enlarge a photo, it doesn't have the quality that you can do now with digital. But that's Kristen with her dad. I don't know, but it looks like to me they were living a pretty good life there for a while. They both look pretty healthy. They both look pretty happy. You know, I I guess they were doing everything that she wanted to do. She got her man. And here, it looks like they're getting a little bit older, and he looks pretty sick here. Of course, now he did have diabetes. He was wearing an insulin pump and he was waiting for a liver transplant. There came a time when he had to quit working and his 60000 went down to 6000 a month. And this is where it really gets on shaky ground for her, really. Let's get on that. This is where they got married. This is the house that he shared with his first wife. 
she killed herself out there when she ran outside. And they had the gall to marry in her home. Really? Really? That is really low class. Don't tell me you didn't have the money to go somewhere else. I wouldn't have even lived there. Really? I would not have lived in that house. Stephanie Stevens awoke May 1st, 2001 and discovered that her 59-year-old husband, who was diabetic, had suffered from end-stage liver dis disease, had died. Investigators didn't find any trauma or crime scene. However, Stephanie was allegedly observed removing the battery from David's insulin pump and taking the device with her out of the room. To determine the cause of death, the coroner drew a sample of David's blood. No autopsy was performed. Her, uh, they did determine that she was 25 years younger than him, and they had been married to other people before they got married in March 1996. David's first wife had died, and they got married in 1997. They also learned that David and Stephanie, a nurse 25 years his junior, worked at the hospital, began when they were married to other people in March 1996. David's first wife, Karen, confronted him about having an affair. Karen grabbed the gun, which went off in her mouth. She survived and went to a hospital rehab unit where she died after an interruption of her ventilator. Stephanie and David wed in 1997. Wonder what happened with that ventilator. Okay, when the report came in of David's blood, here's the medicines. It had the presence of etomidate, a general anesthesia, used in hospitals, and the drug didn't belong there, said Rusty Keys, a former detective sergeant with the Hattiesburg Police Department. Told producers, Keys got a court order to have the doctor's body exhumed for analysis. The autopsy revealed another drug. The cause of death was determined to be Lodanozine overdose and also etomidate toxicity. Stephanie, Stephanie excuse me, claimed she had no knowledge of the drugs in her husband's system. She then alleged that her husband, who was mentally and physically anguished over his failing health, killed himself. Could he have died by suicide? No. I had a theory at the time that it was in the insulin pump, Key told producers. The autopsy confirmed that theory because of the drug's impact on the body. An individual could not have self-administered them. While investigators didn't rule out the possibility of assisted suicide, they dug deep to learn more about David's state of mind in the months and weeks before his death. It was true that he couldn't operate anymore and that his income drastically dropped, but witnesses said David, while disappointed, was generally upbeat. He was on the list for the liver transplant and was looking forward to the future. Detectives also learned that he was planning to leave Stephanie. Oh, he was planning to leave her. Mm -mm -mm. Fellow nurses told investigators that she wanted out of her first marriage and was set on trying to tie the knot with a doctor. Well, David Stevens was it. He was the object of her pursuit. She liked the lavish life his life and sal salary afforded them. But investigators knew that David's death was not an accident, but they needed to find the motive and a way to prove that she killed him. So they followed the money. 
Davis' daughter told investigators that Stephanie was infatuated with knowing how much money David had left and what she was going to get off his death, said Keyes. Most people in town considered her a gold digger. He added that Stephanie didn't really deny any of that. She made it plain that she wanted a doctor and everything that it went with it. By 2002, Stephanie had married a handyman she'd known for just a few weeks. She was moving on with her life and spending her late husband's money at a brisk clip, one of David's colleagues observed. A break in the case came, though, after detectives subpoenaed all of David's financial records. Investigators learned that he maintained a deferred compensation plan with MetLife valued at the time he died at $732,000. Each year he had to sign a form indicating whether he was cashing it out or carrying it forward another year. Um, MetLife sent a renewal form to David on May 1st, 2001, the day he died. When he failed to return it, they resent it on June 1st, and it was, was returned. It appeared to be signed by David and dated April 30th, 2001. That was actually the day before they ever mailed the form. Investigators told producers for Stephanie to receive the payout, the form had to be signed before his death. After his death, the money went to his children. Crime Lab S experts determined that Stephanie had signed the form. Stephanie had committed fraud, said Keyes. The lifestyle she wanted was not going to be there much longer. I believe in her opinion, David was dying anyway, but he wasn't dying quick enough. Detectives believe that David's insulin pump was key to the case, but reasoned that Stephanie had disposed of it. Oh my gosh. I'm telling you, it just, it, okay, I almost stop right there. She put it in the insulin pump. They found it. Okay, now this last clip that you're looking at right now, this tombstone with her date, she did go to prison. She lived out, she died. And this right here really got to me. She is buried in Hillcrest Cemetery in Petal, which is just really part of the Hattiesburg Metro area. My parents and my brother and my nephew are buried in Hillcrest Cemetery. Okay, so... Thank you for listening if you made it to the end. I had a lot to do trying to put this thing together. And I want to do some more crime stories, you know, local kind of things. Bear with me. I'll get better in time. This is my first one. But I was in shock that all this was going on, you know, right under our noses. Um. I had no idea. Anyway, y'all have a blessed week, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care. I am.